Story time with Stephanie um, Hello, I am art historical novelist Stephanie Story. Welcome to my show, Story Time. I could not be more excited about my guest today. It is like impossible. I will tell you why. Uh, first of all, he's a, a, a songwriter who has been in the business for like 40 years, writing smash hits for people like St uh, Steve Perry and Chicago. And Anne Murray, I have to say that one because the first time I knew who you were, you were described to me as the writer of You Needed Me by Anne Murray. So that's why I know who you are. Uh, he's also um, been um, uh, inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Association Hall of Fame. He has a new album out, his own album out this year. It's called Red Eye. It's a great amalgamation of his entire career. You've got to get it. It's like jazzy and poppy and rock and R&B. It's this whole mix of things, which I want to talk to him about. But most importantly, forget all of that, because we're both from the same town. We both hailed from Hot Springs, Arkansas, which hey. is why I could not be more excited to have you here. Thank you for being here, Randy Goodrum. Glad to be here. My pleasure. Um, Okay, so I have to tell you, um, when I was a kid, so I was born in the 70s in Hot Springs. Mm -hmm. And so you were the person who, when I heard about you, I was like, wait, there's this guy from Hot Springs who went off to this magical place called LA and he's a songwriter and he's an artist and he's doing things out of this town. <gasps> Maybe I can do that too. Um, really? Oh, well, that's that's very flattering, and uh, it, it's it was a little more circuitous than uh, just uh, going to LA. And gee, I think I'll go to LA and make it big. Uh, either that, or go to McLeod's. I don't know, one of the two, but or both. <laughs> McLeod's is a great barbecue place in town. People at home, in case you don't know. Oh, sorry about that. You know, <laughs> um, backstory in there, you know. Um, no, but. Okay, so so tell me a little bit when you were growing up in in, in Hot Springs. So for yeah. people who are not from Hot Springs, it feels like a bigger town when you're living here because it's a pretty big population center in Arkansas. But when you leave, like I realized, I was from a small town in a small state. Yes. Well, uh, for me, um, to me, I, I I grew up there not realizing what uh, an amazing town it was, and not just because of, of the weather and the easy living and all of that, but you know we had. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and come out with it. We had illegal gambling, but one of the pro byproducts of illegal gambling is you have a lot of nightclubs, you have a lot of musicians and uh, entertainment and stuff is going on. And in my, I had a propensity towards. Um, music when I was a kid, I was playing by ear when I could just reach the keys and on a key on a piano. And so I had this dream of being a musician and there were musicians everywhere uh, in Hot Springs. They, they had come there for the work, they had come there for the lifestyle. And so I just assumed every town had jam sessions every night and, and, and nightclubs with dance bands. Uh, you know, eight, 10 piece bands and all that, but that's not the case. A little town with 30,000 people, uh, it was kind of an oasis in a way. And so uh, I, even when I would go to Little Rock or, or some of these larger towns to play gigs and things growing up when I got into that, um, I soon found out that, uh, you know, they had far less of that than I realized. And, and of course, I started I started uh, performing in bands and things at a really young age. So I was able to observe that before I knew any better. Um, but anyway, that's uh, uh, that's the thing about Hot Springs. It's it's a it's a bit of an anomaly. It's not it's not the typical little Midwestern Southern town that, that one might think. Yeah, that's true. I, it, 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 it actually makes me think of, of David Hill's new book, The Vapors. It's about that exact period in Hot Springs history when legal gambling took over the town. Did you get a chance to read that book yet? Yes, um, I was in school with his dad, Jimmy, and I knew a lot of the people in the book, especially the locals. Yeah, it's, it's like, oh yeah, I was there. Oh yeah, I remember that and everything. And plus, uh, I really learned my trade as a musician largely at the Vapors. 
the actual nightclub, the Vapors. That was that was a real trial by fire kind of a place to to learn your trade. It, it was a blessing having that there. Uh, yeah, but 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 like before, so you go off to college at Hendrix and you're a music major. But before then, you were you were in the Vapors or around that time. Oh yeah, you? I started playing. Uh, well, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to do this in a in a quick way. It, it's very difficult for me to be brief, but I'll try. Forget um, about it. Well, I started taking piano uh, at a very early age, uh, about eight years old, I think. I think. And, um, you know, I was, I was playing classical music. I was, first of all, I was playing piano by ear so much around the house, I think I was driving my parents nuts, you know? And so I started taking piano. And then I sort of stopped doing that for a while because I wanted to, again, I wasn't sure that that's what I wanted to do uh, as a, as a uh, career. I was too young to even think about what I was gonna do as a career. But uh, eventually, about eighth grade, something like that, I begged and pleaded with my parents. This is, I'm probably the only person on planet Earth that did this. I begged them for me to take piano lessons again. You know, well, I mean, where, where is that in reality? Nowhere. And so I, I found this piano teacher named John Puckett. So I took lessons from him and immediately he uh, started dividing the lesson up. The first half was formal. The second half was jazz, or, you know, just to put it in simple terms. And uh, that was such a blessing. And he was a, he was a taskmaster. I tell you, he, uh, uh, he taught me so much, not only about jazz, but about the, the, the philosophy of, there's an ethic with jazz, which I also use in my writing, which is to be, to find your center, find what you have, what you're trying to do musically, resonate with that and try to build your, whatever your bag is, they used to call it a bag in jazz, whatever your approach is to music, try to try to find out what that is. And it's kind of the same with it being a songwriter too. You kind of find out where your core is. Actually method, I've heard method actors call it a center. You know, they, they look at a character and they try to find what is the center of this character? And then go down and find that and then be that. And so um, I, uh, I, I, I started, because I was learning all these old standards and so forth, I started playing gigs around town for experience. Um, and so then somewhere along the line, because I don't think there were a lot of people who could play and read as well as I could read music, I started getting calls to work at the Vapors because the Vapors was this serious nightclub that had a, a, a dance band, you know, horns, bass, drums, string, I mean, uh, piano and uh, Vegas acts would come through there and they would have these huge, what they call books, like the piano book was, was this big thick thing. And when you would go to rehearsal, you, you wouldn't say, oh, let me look this over for a few minutes, if you don't mind. They would say, no, first song, and they would count it off, boom, you had to read it, and you just page into it, and, and then next song, blah, 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 blah. And so uh, it was it was tough. I'm nervous. It would make me so nervous. But it was the best kind of training for, for the music business in general, I thought, uh, it, that I look, now that I look back. I mean, because I later on was a studio musician and all that. And, uh, um, and so all of that came, all of that Vapors experience really uh, paid off. I have to go back and pick up something you were talking about with the finding your center and finding like the method actors calling it their center and, and finding your bag and all that stuff. Because I've been thinking so much about writers finding their voices. I'm a, I, I'm a novelist, like, right. like trying to, trying to find and hone your voice as you grow as a writer, I think is one of the most difficult parts of any writing. And I think it's probably the most important. So how did you go about trying to find that particular way you were gonna see the world? Was it that mix of classical and jazz? Was it, was it just following the length of your career? Did it change? I don't know, that's a big, huge well, question, but. I'll have to back up a little bit. I, I understand your question and here's the way I'll answer is that, First of all, I, I was training my whole life to be a musician. I never dreamed I would be a writer, not even for a second. I never, it never entered my mind. When I went to college at Hendrix, we had a real small music department. I mean, really small. And so a friend of mine had been asked to write a musical, a school musical. 
And he said, hey, man, uh, can you help me write this musical? Uh, and I said, well, I'm not a writer. And he says, yeah, but you're a jazzer. You know how to make stuff up. And I said, OK, well, I'll give it a day. And he said, I don't have time to do it myself, but if you'll help me, I'll do it. And so I, um, I sat down and we looked at the book. I looked at the first, the script was already written. And so we saw this one scene go by and I said, so this, I thought, you know, this would be, a, maybe we could do a song like blah, blah, blah. So, so I come up with this idea. These guys were at a, a bar or whatever, and they were talking about something. And then something else happens. And I said, well, how about this? And so I realized each one of these situations in the script was sort of like a premise. And, uh, and so I, I immediately, I, I think that's what sort of was, uh, was the first taste of songwriting that I'd done. And now I wrote a whole bunch of songs for that musical. They weren't very good, but I had so much fun. And I said, you know, this is kind of like jazz because um, you, you, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of hard to uh, explain the similarities there, but um, you, you try to come up with something original. You know, there would be occasions where we'd be writing something and, and, and I'd say, you know, I, I think this melody might work, but that's a little bit too like, and I would name some old standard. I said, so we, we got to, we have to stay original here. We can't, you know, even though it's a school musical. So then I would start writing, not thinking, hey, I'm going to write a hit or I'm going to be a hit songwriter. I just, I just fell in love with the process. And so I still considered, well, I, I'm going to be a musician. And uh, songwriting to me became uh, sort of a hobby. It, it was a great place if something was concerning or something bothered me, I could write it out of my system. If I, I found that if I wrote it down on the page and really captured it that way and put it into a song, it was like cathartic. It, it really kind of helped release it. And so I thought, I, I started noticing these things about songwriting and I thought, hmm. And so my, my, and also I had no idea that I hadn't even thought very much about the fact that you know, if you look at an old standard, there, there sometimes are two or three writers on it. And I thought, I, I never even thought about that because I thought everybody that wants to be a songwriter needs to be a songwriter. You need to know how to write the words and the music. So I learned to write the words and the music, but the music came easy. The lyric part was something that, that in talking about finding your voice, I had to uh, right away, I sort of found my voice musically. I, I was able to come up with melodies and, and, and uh, uh, my wife, Gail, who I met the first week in Hendrix, by the way, she was with me during all of this, noticed right away I would, I would be playing a song and, you know, that had been written and she'd say, yeah, that sounds like a real Randy song. I mean, she could really tell there was a style being developed there. But the lyrics, I mean, my lyrics were just terrible and, uh, and, and, not, uh, and they were too moon and June, they were uh, full of platitudes and not you know, stuff that was And so I discovered about eight or so years into my writing that I started writing what I call conversationally. I thought, you know, if you're gonna talk to somebody and you're gonna try to communicate something, you do it in your conversational style and you usually do it in, in an edited way. You don't wanna just rattle off for 20 minutes with somebody that you can say in one line and and so that's when i that's when i sort of turned the corner and started writing lyrics that i thought you know this is not joni mitchell level this is not uh, jimmy webb but it's but it's way better than it was two weeks ago so i would look back two weeks uh, two months whatever and see am i am i getting better and so that was always my my sort of mode of judging my writing to see if I was getting anywhere. When did you figure out you were a success? Like when, when, when did it hit you? Did it take multiple hits? Was it well, like, what what happened. Happened. now this is another hot springs connection. Uh, there was a friend of mine, a musician who was also a real fishing buddy of mine when I was living there as a kid who I lost track of for some time. Uh, I, I went off to Hendrix. Uh, then after Hendrix, I got drafted into the service. Luckily I got into the army band. And um, we spent all this time and everything, and I was still writing and writing and writing and whatever, and sort of collecting my little pile of songs. And 
when I got out of the service, I, I told Gail, I said, you know, we moved back to Little Rock for a while. I said, I'll just play gigs around Arkansas. She was a school teacher. And I said, we'll have our life. Everything will be fine. And so I said to her, I said, I've been writing. And she knew that I've been uh, writing all these songs all these years. And I said, I think I need to get in my square back and go out to LA and see if I can get anybody interested in these songs because they're pop songs. Mm -hmm. And um, they weren't very good, but I thought, you know, you've got to, you got to go out and, and, and find your network somewhere. So I literally, 1971, I think. So I went out there and I took some meetings and played my songs for people and knew right away, I am not ready for prime time. But I did make a couple of uh, business links that, that later on I can reconnect it with. Still, I also sensed that there was a real strong thing about LA, which I think is anytime you get to a music center, a major music center, a major music center like LA or New York or uh, Nashville, one thing that a writer has to be careful of is the influence that you're gonna feel even without realizing it. It's a kind of a meta communication that happens just being there and it influences your work. Now, if you want it to be a positive influence, if you need some of that, then go there for a while in those places. But anyway, getting back to my story. So eventually after a while, I, I got back in my car and drove back to Little Rock. And I told Gail, I said, well, I don't think I'm ready for LA or whether that's ever gonna even be a, a place for us to go. But um, I'll send some songs there in the mail and see what happens. And, and of course that was not a very good idea because you'll never get a song placed that way. But hardly ever, right. except for one. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, so I connected with my friend, Bob Millsap, my fishing buddy I told you about earlier, musician friend who had gone off while I was in college and in the army and had made a career as a songwriter, musician, radio DJ and all that, and was living in Nashville. And uh, I just called him one day and, and, he, and we were just reconnecting as friends. And he said, well, what have you been doing? And I said, well, I went to LA and I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready for that town or, and he said, well, you ought to come check Nashville out. And I said, Bob, I said, I'm not country. I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm a jazz guy, I'm, I'm pop, whatever. And he goes, well, he said, we do everything up here. And he said, you ought to come. He said, I, uh, uh, you ought to just come visit. You can stay at my house. We'll, we'll look around. I'll, I'm producing some records and, and, and jingle sessions. You can play on some if you want, see if you like it. So I said, okay. So I went up there, instantly liked the town. And he used me on a jingle session. There was a Hammond organ out there. He said, just go play some chords on that or something and, uh, you know, and, have some fun. And when I went back in the studio and I heard the playback of a, of a little clip that we'd done, I immediately just got the bug on that, like I got the bug with songwriting. And I said, oh, I love this. So I wanted more of that. I want, hey, I gotta, I gotta play more sessions. That sounds like, so I started lobbying my friend Bob. I said, can you use me on some demos or something? And he goes, well, we do a lot of country music here, but I, I can show you how to do it. I had to kind of learn how to play that style. And that was okay because he said, there's also some pop things that happen or semi pop things and whatever. So I started playing on some of those. And, and so going back and forth to Little Rock and back to Nashville and Little Rock and Nashville. So we eventually uh, relocated there because <clears throat> what happened was Bob also was a successful publisher. And he'd had, he like I said, he'd written some hits and he, he self-published. And um, so I said, uh, you know, I was playing him some of my songs I'd played earlier and he, he liked a couple of them. And his comment to me was, now bear in mind, he was, he was not a jazz guy. He was a rock guy, country guy, whatever. But he, he had an open mind. He had a very 360 degree view on, in, on everything. And he said, um, Randy says, uh, I'm not really sure what you're doing musically. All I know is I like it and I'll publish some of it if you want. I, you know, we'll make some demos. We'll pitch it around, see if we can get some bites. And, uh, and I said, oh, great. So we did some demos and they were not typical. They were not typical of anything on the pop charts and definitely not anything Nashville could use, but I had a place 
for me to put my work and uh, I was playing with real players and and uh, an interesting thing about this though there was a new movement going on in Nashville in the early 70s up up to about 1980 it was sort of a hybrid pop thing uh, you had people like Dr. Hook England Dan, John Ford Coley, Gene Cotton, Dave Loggins, oh, Dobie Gray. They were doing definitely pop records, but they were Nashville influenced for sure. They were songs, they were records that really couldn't have been done that way anywhere else but Nashville. And I actually kind of arrived at a good time because my early hits were very much uh, influenced by that movement. You referenced this earlier that all that your career was circuitous, right? And I think we all were. I mean, I, you know, I didn't just suddenly land in LA either. You sort of get there through these weird paths. And I was just thinking about um, how you did. So many people, I think now, feel like they have to have this clear goal of exactly I'm going to go from here to here to here, and that does not seem to be how artistry ever works. Is it? You're, you're. I'm, I'm pleased to hear you say that because. You know, a lot of these seminars that people go to, uh, songwriting seminars and in every other kind of field, people are looking for a linear path or, or God forbid, a shortcut. And the thing is, a lot of times it's, it's just not that way at all. And, and like, and you keep mentioning LA. Uh, and when I, about 1980, I realized that there was a paradigm shift going on in Nashville, in my opinion. This is just my opinion. And that my time there uh, was going to have to be over if I was going to continue my career because I was writing pop stuff. Yeah. I mean, I could cross pollinate. I did write a bunch of country hits too, but they were more, when I would write a country song rather than writing a, a, a twangy country song, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, I would write it as an R&B kind of a song, a bluesy song, and then it can be done country. So, but that really wasn't my voice, as you call it. That wasn't my core. That wasn't my center. And, and I kept feeling uh, a pull to move either to New York or LA. And, and Gail and I loved New York. We worked in New York for a while on, a, on some projects. So we tried, we tried moving to there first. We moved to Connecticut. But I, I kept, the minute I left Nashville, for some reason, the phone just started ringing off the wall from my LA colleagues. I had been going to LA, even from Nashville, I'd been traveling out there regularly in the 70s. I had met uh, and worked with Steve Lukather, the, with Toto, uh, uh, Michael McDonald, so before they were major artists. And so we, we tried the East first, but I was on the plane to LA all the time. And, and so we gave in and finally moved out there in 1984 to LA. Uh, which was a good time to be there because uh, this movement was going on. Another movement that I was part of was the, uh, as they call it, West Coast One Word. And it's the, it's the music of uh, Toto and, and uh, Al Jarreau and, and uh, Chicago and George Benson and, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire, people like that. And so that was the kind of stuff going on. And so I had, and a lot of the people I work with had jazz backgrounds like me. We all started off as jazzers. But yet we played rock and roll too, and we sort of cross-pollinated and ended up with this, this new hybrid form. So you just now came out with, you, you had a new album out come out this year. Yes. What I'm wondering is, are you still learning? Are you still growing as an artist? Has oh, it yeah. changed? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that never stops, really. I, I think as long <laughs> I as I'm that. breathing, I, I, you know, the thing is, uh, I, I, I don't really try to write a song so it will be a hit. I, I don't try to do work uh, that, I, I just have a, a, a passion about doing the process. I love writing songs. I love coming up with a, or thinking of a premise or getting being influenced by some little thing that's happened and, and, and morphing it over into a, uh, and creating a character and, and, and method acting. Uh, you know, cause when I write, I mean, I'm writing songs about things that's never happened to me and never will happen to me. You know, just make stuff up, and uh, but it's fun doing it. And I and the thing is, uh, I started off doing it by myself, and and I find myself still. I, I you know I'll do to my I'll do respect to my co-writers. I really love writing by myself, 
uh, and I, and I, it's just fun. It, it's not work. It never has been work. And the, this solo record, Red Eye, is, is a solo record that I always wanted to make. You know, I've been so busy as a songwriter. Uh, I, I, I had one ambition leg that I thought, well, I think I'll go be a recording artist and go perform and do all that. And then the other part of me was the writing part. And the writing part was such a full on full time career. And once I got into it, uh, I was busy all the time. The phone never stopped ringing. So you gotta you gotta go with that. And and I love it. And it's uh, I don't have to do the, the same six or seven songs every night, six nights a week. You know, every day is a new day. So uh, and every day I can write a new song. But but this album is it's you. I mean, you're performing, you're singing, you're lead vocal, you're you're playing. You wrote it. Some of the songs by yourself. Some of the songs with collaborators. Well, this yeah, this uh, this album actually is a co-production uh, uh, with Larry Williams, who's a, a dear friend of mine. is a fantastic LA arranger, keyboard player. He, he and I, when we sit at, the, at keyboards facing each other. It sounds like we're the same brain, you know. We, we play the same voicings and everything, and uh, he's terrific. He was Al Jarreau's, uh music director for uh, forever, and uh, he's played on just thousands of hits as a as a horn player in L.A. And so he's, um, uh, but he's also a terrific songwriter. And and we just had a meeting in the minds, and I asked him. I said, you know, we we were writing some songs together. Uh, hoping to have Al record them someday, and then unfortunately he passed away. But, but I said, well, let's let me take some of these and add some of mine. If and why don't you help me uh, do this solo record? Because this is wow, this is really what I want to do. And so he said, sure. So we did, and we ended up with Red Eye. How has it been to put it out into the world? Has it been diff? Is it different? I guess to put out your music like that in that way than it is as a songwriter it, it, you know i'm a novelist mine comes out the same way no matter what randy you know i mean it's a book it's a book it's a book you know well you know it's like the difference is when i write a song uh and i'm fortunate if somebody somebody else like ann murray you mentioned ann murray oh by the way i was going to mention uh, earlier i said uh, pitching songs from the mail uh, in the mail is a bad idea from Little Rock to whatever. Yeah. Actually, I sent you needed. We sent you needed me to Ann Murray in the mail. That's how she got it. And um, but uh, but I would say that there there are a, a, quite a large number of examples of people who have recorded my songs, and I've been very pleased. And it's better than anything I would have done. I think you know. Uh, but quite often I'm thinking, boy, if I had done that myself, I would have done this and done that, whatever. But in the case of Red Eye, I got to do it exactly the way I think it should sound uh, and, and produce it exactly the way I thought it should be produced and with the right instruments and the right players. I mean, all those are, are my hero players. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the players on that record, but they're some of the, the, the best in the world in, in, in their category. And um, I was very honored that they would even play on it. So uh, I'm a happy camper. I don't know what this question means, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> what uh, <laughs> uh, what are you what are you still trying to do with your music? You've had a really long career. You've done all kinds of things that some of which you expected, some of which you did not. A lot of which you did not seem to expect. What are you still trying to do? with your music when you put it out in the world? Because I don't think any artist puts something out in the world without an intention of hoping to have an impact in some way. Here's the thing. It's, um, music is a little bit, uh, uh, releasing, writing a project or releasing or writing a song and doing a demo and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to think of an analogy. It's a little bit like fishing in a way, on Lake Hamilton where you are where you get all this great gear and you get it all prepared and you put the perfect bait on there and you throw it at this perfect spot and you either catch, that's either where the fish are or where they're not, or it's, uh, it's too early or it's too late or it's uh, the wrong kind of weather or uh, it's the wrong bait for that particular fish that was swimming by, you know. So what, what, what my point is, 
I quit worrying about that. What happened to me in the first time I had uh, hits, uh, and I say hits because the first time I had success, I had four hit songs in one year. And it was, it was like a fluke of nature. I mean, it was a freak of nature. It was, um, I had said to belong to someone else came out with uh, England Dan, John Ford Coley. And then Before My Heart Finds Out with Gene Cotton and then Bluer Than Blue. And then You Needed Me. And so the thing, the, the thing about that is I'm not bragging saying that. The thing that what it did to me was it didn't make me get the big head. It humbled me actually, because I realized none of these were interconnected in any way. Uh, they were all uh, just, it all just kind of happened. It was like throwing that bait into a, a, a spot where there were a thousand fish and three of them jumped on because they all wanted it. And you end up catching three fish. You know, it's like that unlikely. And so I, uh, from then on, I just thought, you know, the main thing to do is do the work, have it ready, uh, always be ready. Uh, I, if I were to tell a young writer what to do is, you know, prepare for success. If you want to use a sort of a, uh, some sort of a slogan, I guess. But by what you do is you just do your work. And then when opportunity knocks, which it does all the time, then the worst feeling is to say, oh, I don't have anything for that, you know. Or to say, you know, I've got, uh, I've got two or three over here that I wrote a couple of years ago that, hey, boom, you know, because the thing is, I'm writing, I might write, I might write a song that has nothing to do with what's going on in the record market right now, in the pop market, in the, uh, the jazz market, uh, the country market, rock, anything. But the thing is, it, it's, it exists, it's sitting there, like Sad of Long was several years old when it, before anybody recorded it. You Needed Me was, oh, I don't, don't want to tell you how many years old that was. And nobody wanted that song. Uh, and, um, but, th you know, things have a season. And, and if you, you know, if it's the right seed at the right, in the right soil at the right season, it's going to spring up. But it's, it's a very fragile, and it's a very, um, it's not entirely luck because uh, I think skill and preparation has to fit in there. I mean, again, uh, people are constantly wanting to be entertained and, and, by, and they want to hear something they never heard before. And they want to hear a new way of saying something or a, they want to see a, uh, something new visually, you know, they, they don't want to just see the same old stuff or hear the same old thing. And so they're always looking for something fresh. That's my opinion. And so uh, the thing is, is just get your ducks in a row. And if you get an opportunity and, and you got the ducks, then go for it, you know. <laughs> Ventana 